So are you are you all ready to start? We are, we are still missing one of the sp uh, speakers. Yes. Um. Yes. You know, he's coming later, or do you know any? The f it, it's actually our number three one. So if he's not showing up, we will have uh, a little bit of a shorter session or use time for discussion. So, but since we have already three speakers here, I think we can start. Uh, so. Um, my name is Ulrich. I work for um, um. Coventry University. There is a center for agroecology, um, uh, water and resilience. And I'm a, I'm a scientist there. I've done a lot of work with uh, organic farming. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, work with uh, economics of farming uh, and also uh, work with um, uh, social and community groups. Uh, so in a way, I'm, I'm partly a natural scientist and also partly a social scientist. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm very much interested, and we do, I have PhD students working on permaculture, so I'm very much interested in the research uh, uh, of it and different ways of, of just finding knowledge, capturing knowledge, moving it forward. So, so, so I'm very happy that I can chair this session. And that's uh, all from me. So we have three speakers. From the outline we saw, we, we give every speaker like 20 minutes and then have at least 10 minutes of discussion. Some of the speakers said, and I leave them leave it to them, they want discussions even earlier during the presentation. That's also fine. I just wanted to make sure that at the moment I still think we will, may have, have some, you know, uh, number four speaker may arrive. Uh, so I will have for each of the three sessions, let's say half an hour. Uh, and then we will still have, have time uh, as such. And we will go in, in, in the order of, of this booklet, so like on pra page 25. Um, so we start with Isis. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So what should I say about you? Maybe you can say more. Isis is the head of the uh, Faculty of Environment and in Interdisciplinary Studies at the Cross... Yeah, to, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> at the Crossfields Institute. And I think that's all I say. And if you want to say more, just do that. Uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Let's go on. Hi. Um, really pleased to be here. It's very exciting, isn't it? I don't know about you. I've been to some exciting sessions. Um, so uh, I'm here to talk about holistic research. It's a particular interest <coughs> to me because we run a master's course on researching holistic approaches to agroecology. So uh, we're all the time trying to work out what would be holistic research. Um, thinking about permaculture, thinking about research, it looks like there are some um, disjunctions there. Um, so I've just brought up a few, and I, I invite anybody to say, no, that isn't a disjunction. Or, you know, we can get around that one or whatever. You know, just you know, interrupt as you wish. Um, so basically, we've got permaculture applied, research academic, permaculture is very socially open and free, that's an aim of permaculture, whereas um, research is often socially closed or restricted. I'm sure you've all had this experience of looking for a paper that's particularly interesting, you've heard about, and then you get the, sorry, you do not have access to this article. Um, so there's all of that, you know, uh, side of things. I, there was a fa fantastic article by um, George Monbiot in The Guardian uh, some time ago now. He said, if you want to find an example of turbo capitalism, look at academic publishing. Yeah. All the work that's done is done for free or publicly funded, and then the, the results of that are closed for the public. So um, there's obviously work there to be done. But anyway, we have these kinds of uh, uh, differences. So solo solutions or in orientated in permaculture, um, values-based, contextual, progressive, um, against facts-based, universal, and conservative. But taking on board one of the things mentioned today by... Um, who was it? Somebody mentioned about them and us, not getting into them and us mentality. I also wanted to mention some of the ideals of the academy. What, what our university is actually about. What were the ideals in setting up 
universities. So I just wanted to mention a few of those just to kind of, you know, not exactly redress the balance, but start to think about that. So some of them are things like the idea of the academy as uh, meritocratic, not autocratic. Those of us who've worked in universities might say that, that ideal is being kind of lost, but it is there as an ideal. There's the idea of Socratic dialogue, to draw out, not to dictate. And so that's there, in particularly in contemporary teaching approaches. Um, the idea that the best ideas win out through examination of evidence and reasoned debate. So there's this idea of, uh, if you like, a, it's a, in a sense, it's a marketplace. It works like a marketplace. Um, peer review, not governed, not, not governmental control. So again, we might want to question that, um, changes in the way in which uh, universities are operating. But the idea is um, peer review. I'm, I'm certainly a peer review in the way in which journals are freely <laughs> peer reviewed before they close down. Um, but also, um, I'm just, you know, I, I can remember being in, in university departments where who was going to be head of department was just something that rotated around, you know, and it was something that people didn't actually want to do. It was just a bit of a service that you did. So there was this sort of idea of uh, judgment by peers, and that runs through a lot of a lot of uh, processes in in academia. Um, the idea of research serving the common good, as well. Um, the aim of widening participation and the idea of cultural enrichment that university education is there as part of cultural enrichment, and the idea of upholding standards of quality. So there are some things going on in universities or in the ideal of the university that you know, do meet some of the ideas within permaculture. So there should be a meeting possible, but I just wanted to tease out some of the pitfalls or some of the things standing in the way. And those of you who were at last, uh, yesterday's um, research um, dialogue and discussion will be aware of uh, some of this. So we saw it yesterday in the discussion of research in the tension between developing metrics and the separation of the different areas that those metrics might apply to. Um, so I just picked out a few things here. Um, the disciplinary nature of academic research. So where does permaculture fit? Does it fit in horticulture, ecology, agriculture, anthropology? Um, geography, agroecology, um, where it fits or where we think it fits will determine which kind of research tools we think are the appropriate research tools to use. Um, then there's the experimental norm of isolating variables and this is a key problematic one which we encountered yesterday in the, in the discussion there. So how do you cope with whole systems or context specificity? How do you cope with those things instead of uh, just deciding what this thing that you're going to isolate uh, in order to come up with testable results that can be repeated? There's the demand for objectivity and the avoidance of observer effect. But where does that leave attitudinal, um, the attitudinal elements of permaculture? Where does that leave the... the, the um, the approach one has to one's land, um, you know, does that not feature at all in how we're thinking about researching? There's the demand for falsifiability as well. Does that demand fit with the kind of proselytizing style of permaculture? There's the continual return to founding texts. Um, what would potential evidence be that we would accept that permaculture doesn't work? <coughs> we need to start thinking about those things if we're going to say that it fits the falsifiability criteria. However, sorry, I'm doing the moving back and forth thing. <laughs> but um, I should have said, actually, my, my uh, original discipline is philosophy, so... <laughs> This is just what we do. Um, so, however, there are new developments in research, within mainstream research as well. Disciplinarity. 
we've got a shift in towards uh, transdisciplinarity as a response to the complexity of real world issues. So that's a, um, a response that's actually going on and yes, getting some momentum within universities. Um, we've got experimental method, a lot more participatory research um, using those kinds of models, citizen science, web two tools, which we heard about in one of the last um, keynote people talking about the power of those web two, two tools for people to co collaborate. Um, Objectivity, <coughs> we've also got the questioning and the idea of self-examination and critical reflection being built into research um, as a, a core to qualitative research particularly. And we've got falsifiability, not only being questioned as a philosophical idea within scientific work, but we've also got it being rejected in terms of practicality. We've just got urgent things to get on with and we need to just get on with them and see what works. Um, so how might we develop a, um, a research approach that's appropriate for permaculture? So I did the obvious thing, so obvious that in talking just now amongst the speakers, we're two of us, Tom has also done a similar thing as well, although he's got some very nice examples which I think you might uh, bring in. So we've got 12, we've got Holmgren's 12 principles. So I thought, well, let's take those 12 principles and see what they would mean in terms of research. And I'm just kind of, I'm just, you know, I'm thinking that um, those of you who've got a lot of familiarity and a lot of practice in permaculture might see other connections and say, oh, no, that principle would actually be reflected in research by this. Um, and once we break it down to research, you'll see there's a lot of repetition as well. Did you find that, Tom, when you were doing, when you were mapping yeah, so them onto the... Yeah, overlap and intersection, yeah. and that's also true in design. We yeah. find the yeah. same types of properties. Yeah, a, a lot of overlapping. Yeah, so these are the ones I, I, I would just kind of suggest. So we've got observe and interact, obviously a lot of observation. Um, the use of delicate experiments, I'll explain that in a bit. Catch and store energy, record and share findings. Um, obtain a yield, consolidate the findings and publish them. Um, apply self-regulation and accept feedback. So avoid self-deception, give and receive feedback. Use and value renewable resources and services, share methods and repeat experiments. So don't you know? Don't reinvent. Find out what other people are doing and do some do some uh, repetition. Produce no waste. I like this one. Record everything. Um, it's quite interesting hearing uh, you know people starting to do some research and not necessarily realising how important it is to record every sort of <coughs> dimension that's that's going on. Um, Do you want to chip in, Tom, with any any of these? Because yeah, I think you were trying to find them in particular examples. Yeah, weren't all you? All that's what you're going to show. Uh, you to chip in. That's what that's what you're going to show. So, design from patterns to details. So be responsive to nature and shaping your questions. I wasn't sure about that one. What do you think? Has anyone got a better suggestion for that? What would design from patterns to details? Mm. How would that turn <coughs> into an idea? Well, something we've been looking at uh, design, designing the research strategy in the association was actually thinking about the design process and how that, does that design process overlay with the research process? You know, yeah. Because there is there are issues quite obvious overlap <coughs> there. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I could talk about that. Yeah. I mean, whatever you're doing in terms of the actual, you know, the actual <coughs> research you're doing, obviously the, the principles are going to apply in their and it's also normal about form. Values, uh, basic starting <coughs> values, as you're saying. Yeah. You know, so basically, that's a pattern, the values and the design process. Yeah. And then the details, whatever your research. Yeah. And yeah. methodology, isn't it, really? It's the, it's the methodology we yeah. the methodology that you're going to use. Yeah. So I think this is a way of saying, well, what would be an appropriate methodology? Well, let's see. <coughs> let's see if it's doing some of these things. Isn't it's also it, about it's possibly the combination between systemic and analytic research methods mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do we develop systemic? Yeah. Research and methods? combine them with yeah. analytical work. Yeah. Yeah. It's also making sure that your kind of subsidiary questions 
relate to your overarching research question? Mm. Yeah, yeah, how yeah, yeah. relevant. Yeah. Yeah, re really choose the right question yeah. <laughs> as well, not, you know, not top and tent. Um, okay, so integrate rather than segregate, collaborate. Um, small and slow solutions. I've got their gather, gather evidence over many iterations, but also enroll others, you know, um, gather from many on the same question. Uh, using citizen science techniques, you could you could think along those lines. Um, use and value diversity. Again, use many methods, many techniques. Um, use edges and value the marginal. Again, this was one I was sort of thinking, mm, I don't know if that that fits. Uh, but don't focus on single benefits. For example, you. Um, it could also be, I suppose, the disaggregation of your. It could be, um, you know, gender, gender disaggregation, and so the, the kind of data sets that you capture. Yeah. yeah. Disability yeah. status in the community, etc. Yeah. 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 Really, and that goes back to recording everything, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, creatively use and respond to change. Find out what others are doing. And respond to it. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. yeah. I think it's um, use and value of diversity. It's the interactions which you need to study. Mm -hmm. Oh and yes, of course. Yes. Um, also, the responding creatively, responding. It's that interaction, that change within what's happening. Mm. So yeah. I think that's what it yeah. is about. Yeah. Yeah, that's what's really important, isn't it? It's, it's the whole system. Yes, so and it's how changing, it's interacting yeah. in different ways. Yeah, which is a nightmare if you're <coughs> if you're thinking of setting up a particular, you know, a very structured research approach. Yes, yes. This, this is this is the problem. Yeah. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just pick out a couple of those to to look at in a bit more detail. Um, so observe and interact. Um, and I, I I mentioned use delicate experiments. And I suppose I'm, I'm thinking there in terms of something like Goethe in science, um, where Goethe talks about this idea of delicate empiricism, where you really are tuning into and responding to the phenomenon that you are studying, whether it's a system or a, a part of a system. You're really tuning into that. And within Goethe in science, there's a whole process that, that you can... Uh, you can enter into to develop those those skills, those observational skills. Um, so Goethe in science is just one means to uh, to integrate human the human being into the research and to respond to nature as a system, as a process, because that was one of the things that Goethe was kind of realizing um, that things are always within the, the wider systems. As, as you talked about the overlap among the principles earlier, that's also an example of integrating rather than segregating. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And <coughs> integrating the, the, the researcher. So Goethe talks about the researcher becoming this delicate instrument of the research. Um, okay. And then the other one, just the catch and store energy. I just pulled together a few things about the, the recording. Because, of course, in permaculture, there's a really good tradition of recording uh, in the permaculture design, you know, sort of looking at everything first and recording um, the different sectors. Uh, and then that goes down into different layers as well. So, but also things, once a, once a process is up and running, a daily log, self-reflection, selecting key questions. I put there the um, URL for the Permaculture Association Handbook on Research, because that's a very accessible guide that you can look at. Um, continue to develop a common language and set of standards. I think that's the important thing, and I think that's, you know, that's what the real work of the conference is kind of really thinking about, isn't it, in these research sessions. Um, and we heard in one of the talks today about the importance of a common language. We have to do something about guild planting as a term. <laughs> 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 um, so published findings, permaculture journals. Um, 
And then integrate rather than segregate. So collaborate on research questions. Okay, so use what's out there in the academic research on things like horticulture, agriculture, agroecology. But what we have to be aware of is the mindset and the frameworks through which that research is done um, in order to understand the tools that are being used. So we have to understand a bit about how those different disciplines approach research and the tools they use. Um, but there's no reason why permaculture can't contribute to that and, if necessary, adapt its approach a little bit in terms of the research to make something that would make sense to people in those other disciplines. Um, and then I think just generally keep a very open dialogue about what more holistic approaches would be. I think there's it, there is. I'm, when I, after doing those, I kind of thought, oh yeah, there's plenty to go on, there's plenty to work on to develop this, this approach. But I think there is always, and something we need to be aware of, a creative tension between positivity and criticality. And uh, there's an excellent paper by Ferguson and Lovell. <coughs> Ferguson and Lovell's paper is very, very good in reviewing permaculture literature and academic responses to permaculture. Um, and one of the things that they pick out is this kind of tireless positive <laughs> aspect of, of permaculture, which is great. You know, it's great. We're looking at dire situations and we're being very positive and solutions focused on them. But there is a tension there with the way in which research has to be very critical, it has to be sceptical in order to really kind of <coughs> reflect on the results we're getting. So I think that there's a creative tension there that needs to be attended to. Um, it's a tension that's there in mainstream science as well, but, uh, but I think we, we, uh, we need to kind of focus on that. So to conclude, I just think we have to keep, keep positive. It's worth the, the positivity is worth more than the <laughs> criticality in some areas. So keep positive. Yeah. Um, and in that positive message we can talk to others about the efficacy of um, permaculture practice but we also through research have to be open to um, throwing away a long cherished practice if we discover that actually it doesn't work doesn't increase soil fertility um, doesn't increase yield or doesn't add to better animal welfare we have to kind of jettison that and say, okay, that's what the research has shown us. And that's where I was just going to end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do we have any? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's okay. Any specific questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's just a, a point, really. I think we need to distinguish between research and evaluation because mm -hmm. they, they have a, a different um, mm -hmm. slant. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so I, I just wanted to make that point. Yeah. How would you, what would you call the difference? How would you define the difference? Um, the evaluation is looking at, at what works and what doesn't work and mm -hmm. why or yeah. how. Yeah. So that, um, and research is more open-ended, really. It's, it's, it's uh, asking a question, it's curious. But evaluation mm -hmm. maybe is more for the outside world. If evaluation, if independent evaluation can show the, the, the benefits of, of, of permaculture, it will carry weight yeah. with the outside world and help to get it yes. uh, to propagate yeah. permaculture. But there's a role for evaluation within research because that's sort of the core of it, isn't it? You know, it's testing things out, possibly. Well, yes. Yeah. I think there's a, there's, there's a nice difference between them, but I think mm. it's a difference that we need to be aware of. Mm. Well, I would agree on that because you can be in a situation where, I mean, I come from a different field, by the way, but I'm just trying to <laughs> translate from my field yeah. to your field. But I mean, you can be in a situation where you could research something until it works, or you could evaluate at this point in time and say it's not working right now with the knowledge I currently have. I think that's what I'm Yeah, about yeah. problem. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, the, behind you was, but that doesn't matter. One of you. <laughs> I think that might be what Tom's going to do. Okay. <laughs> um, no, it wasn't. Okay. Um, yes? Um, no, what I was um, thinking of, like, I'm following on what, what people said uh, before me. Uh, uh, I think uh, there's a distinction between, uh, like, R&D, which is research and development, which I think a lot of practical permaculture, actually, we need to think not so much about pure research. We need to think about research and development basically because we have like real life uh, practical challenges, got like big, uh, mm -hmm. big, big uh, real, real life, real life situations to deal with. And so we can't necessarily like go through the like long term academic uh, process of like falsifiability and all that. We need to try things, fail and fail better the next mm -hmm. time. You know, so mm -hmm. that's basically the research mm -hmm. R&D mm -hmm. approach. Yeah. Uh, there is also an important role for the more analytical and evaluative research we, we have. But I think there's plenty of good sort of patterns to detail, you know, there's yeah. two different patterns there that mm -hmm. uh, are both worth looking at for different mm -hmm. purposes. I, w I would tend to see them all, all, all the same. It's all asking uh, a question, so. isn't it? Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, they're all research, yeah. but yeah. Uh, they, yeah, research is the overall pattern, but yeah. they are two less the patterns within that and they then break down yeah. yeah, lots of different approaches, lots of different yeah. techniques, lots of yeah, within that. But it's all I, I would think of it as all research. If you you know, if you're just saying does this work? On the, on the broadest level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Should we move on? Yeah, mm -hmm. Dr. One more. What one final mm -hmm. question or comment here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's um, something along the lines of this pattern of what are we doing this for anyways? And what is the design of research and its multiplicity of uses or points of contact? Um, and it still feels like we're within the architecture of the paradigm of kind of being silent and, and numb and unfeeling and taking from. But in the observe and interact, how are we much more dynamically involved and in looking at the research as being a proactive um, stimulus and holding it that way? Um, so. I, I'm very curious about this for, for all of us, and it's part of yeah. why I'm here. And <coughs> some of the other speakers will continue to speak to this. Yeah. I, I really appreciate what you presented. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think uh, there's one thing that it's worth saying about this and why it's so important, this, this tension between the positivity and the, and the, uh, the criticality. It's not a hobby. <laughs> you know, it's really important that we have results and we have things that we can share. Because this this could you know this could feed people who need food. Um, so in a sense, it, there has to be a kind of seriousness and intent about it as well, as well as just inspiring it also. Because a lot of people start as a hobby and then you know develop it from there. And the people who are doing it as a hobby can al can also contribute. And even in just in your answer, it's a case in point of part of my point of what do we mean by results. Mm. That's, yeah. You can see that through a multiplicity yeah. of lenses. Yeah. And I guess what we want to know is the best way to do something. You know, or are we, you know, because we mm -hmm. might be expending energy on a yeah. particular practice which just doesn't actually help. And so identifying what really, what really works, what really helps and what doesn't is really important. Um, yeah. And I should... I mean, one of the, one aspect of this practicality thing is the transdisciplinarity, because one of the features of transdisciplinary research is that it always involves stakeholders. So it doesn't just kind of go on separate from the people who are actually on the ground doing the stuff. Um, and as we heard yesterday, even the chickens are stakeholders. Mm -hmm. <coughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You're still here if we come to a more general discussion later on. So I'll just introduce uh, Tom quickly. Um, so you completed your PhD in environmental anthropology at Kent University. Mm -hmm. That's right. And now you are at the Schumacher Institute in Bristol as a research fellow. Mm -hmm.
for it. So that's that's all I wanted to say as introduction. If you want to say more, <laughs> it's up to you. Tom. Uh, I think a lot of irrelevant background will just come out naturally in uh, in this presentation, which it's um, based on the work that I've been involved in over the past few years with uh, um, a range of colleagues, including Michelle Bastian, who's just spotted herself in the middle of this picture here. Michelle isn't texting in the middle of this, uh, in the middle of co-facilitating this meeting. She's actually being diligent and capturing and store energy by taking photos of the pages that are on the floor <laughs> and uh, contributing to our rigorous documentation of our work together. I've um, Michelle and I um, have been collaborating for several years on what became the Transition Research Network and initially began an exploration of um, how to address this cultural barrier that, um, cultural disjunction that ISIS referred to between the basic values and premises that have become predominant in academia even if as ISIS said they're not necessarily consistent with some of the historical values and the values that we're seeking to promote through permaculture, through transition and related fields. I've also, for uh, uh, since before then, <coughs> since about 2009, I think, I first uh, joined the Research Advisory Board for the uh, Permaculture Association here, which Tomas was one of the founders, and Tomas has been this great source of information for me in terms of just these inspirational insights into how different research looks when you consider it through a permaculture lens and in relation to this dichotomy that uh, Thomas referred to this is much more about this the conceptual reshaping of research that was about considering how how can it be part of this project for social change that we're all involved in and it's a great example, Isis and I, when we got here, we realised this great overlap between the approaches were taken. And to me, it's a great example of using and valuing diversity, these uh, two takes we've got being so complementary here in the different perspectives that have started to come out here and the, the role of permaculture and other countercultural ways of thinking in helping us reconsider the role of research as one of what's become of one of the quite damaging institutions. Right. Certainly on this, as Isis mentioned, I'm going to be referring to the Holcomb principles later as she did. There's another precedent in the literature, a very nice paper that um, James Vatitu and J um, Josh Locklear wrote in the Culture and Agriculture Journal in 2008. And they were both uh, doing PhDs in environmental anthropology. Um, my nominal field, I like to think of myself as quite undisciplined, and um, they discussed this interface between permaculture and environmental anthropology. Do you mind if I can get the question back? And um, yeah. use the whole room principles again in very different ways. I'm thinking permaculture design, as everybody's got a, a different take on them. And um, certainly when we apply them to research, people are applying them in very different ways. <coughs> Conceptually, and this is another, this builds on very nicely, I think, on the, the <coughs> treatment that uh, ISIS gave of comparing permaculture and conventional academic practice. And I've used as a guiding concept for a lot of my work on this autopoiesis, this concept of the uh, self-generative property that's characteristic of living systems that Umberto Maturana identified in the a biologist in the 1970s and living systems creating the conditions that allow their own reproduction, their self-reliance, self-generative self in that respect. And to me this contrasts with the dominant pattern that's emerged in a lot of, of conventional research and particularly social research which in this term would be heteropoietic when it's relying on degradation in systems outside it for, um, uh, uh, for its perpetuation. When Michelle and I first started working with Transition Network around this situation we found common reports of quite negative experiences that Ben Brangwyn of Transition Network summarised in this notion of 
extractive research of researchers just coming in and mining these transition groups and communities for uh, for data and just dra drawing on people's time and energy and creating a lot of <coughs> cynicism and bad feeling. It's but also we had lots of examples of positive interactions and positive relationships. So this um, uh, and but this was a, a very common feeling when research becomes quite instrumental in the people it works with, it treats them as passive research subjects, it refuses to get involved through these notions of objectivity and detachment which as a philosopher uh, you'll uh, hopefully agree are fundamentally flawed and um, uh, yeah. this new impact agenda which has become a slightly controversial among many academics notion that their work should be of interest to anybody but their own in intellectual community which at its best has become the um, academic version of corporate social responsibility at its worst just furthers this notion of, of extraction where people need community groups to uh, communicate their research to to, uh, to show this, uh, this impact. There's a long-standing trend that we've drawn on in a lot of this work, which I'd refer to as allopoietic, whereby a separate, although working as a separate system, a separate entity, the research process is contributing to the autopoietic, the self-generative, self-maintaining potential of the social phenomena it's working with through attention to the applications of research, looking for positive applications, positive practical use through being critical of the context in which it's produced in ways that might help to endorse or reinforce some of the critical <coughs> arguments of, of social movements, often engaged in courses, often, uh, often in advocacy. What's really interested, come to interest me is how research itself can be part of processes of social transformation, partly by working within permaculture transition as part as an integral part of the processes. And in permaculture, we've um, the research, the work of the research advisory board is often focused on this need for better evidence, the need for critical self-reflection that ISIS has talked about and to what extent there are tools in formal research, of which there are many, and Rafters S. Ferguson's work's a, a great example, that can help with that critical self-reflection. And to also to look at ways in which we can ask the question, well, if we're thinking about the world we want, this theme of these two days, and how society will look there, what's the, the nature and role of research, and can the types of changes in research process that come from really taking on board the aims, the philosophies, the values, and the methods of permaculture, how can that contribute to answering that question and bringing that change about? Just a few, a few examples. I mentioned the UK Permaculture Association's research strategy, which is a very um, really maturing in ways. But this conference becomes such a it's a great reflection of how far that's come. Uh, uh, the work that Michelle and I and others have, have been doing in the Transition Research Network is uh, is documented there. I've more recently uh, taken some of that work into the research component of ECALISA, which is a European-wide network of community-based sustainability initiatives, of which the Permaculture Culture Association is a, a key and founding member, and um, which has adopted research as one of the, the central pillars of its work. Again, seeing the importance of these two questions of how can these transition groups, permaculture projects, eco-villages, which are the core membership, continue to draw on relevant science and research in improving what we do, being self-critical, and how can we best mobilise the resources available to us to make an informed and reasoned evidence base for policy. Um, again, using the value of diversity and people coming up with different ideas, researching community is a largely German set of researchers who were mostly involved in eco-village research and have 
come to similar conclusions and outside this there are many there are many examples cropping up the Occupy Research Collective which is uh, a group of researchers who were central in the Occupy movement have uh, come up with some parallel approaches and um, that's a, a book that we produced a couple of years ago but, um, which I'm giving away for probably the very last copy so please take as many as you can so, uh, and make them the last copies Shall I pass them around? Uh, sure, if you'd like. Kerry's already taken six for uh, <laughs> the home transition group, I can add a way. As a tool, I've been, and a conceptual tool, I've been looking very much at the Hatter language work with Christopher Alexander, which... Uh, those of you who have a background in permaculture may well be familiar, but widely talked about and uh, more occasionally used in patterns. There, Christopher Alexander describes patterns as resolutions of forces, so a particular response to particular situations which allow this basic generative impulse, which is the heart of all life and in Alexander's philosophy, uh, cosmic processes of creation to bring that into any human endeavour and more practically in, uh, in the work here it's a democratising tool patterns in some way encode some specialised knowledge of a particular field and ways that make it communicable and usable so it allows what are often expert led processes to, um, uh, to become much more inclusive uh, uh, Alexander was an architect and his group sort of undermined the authority of the architects in the building process in the same way I say it important to draw upon researcher skills in ways that undermine the power of researchers as the privileged brokers of knowledge and having the privileged access to them mm -hmm. by creating tools to communicate specialised knowledge and make the other types of knowledge that non-academic spring to collaborative research relevant and useful bringing out this uh, uh, transdisciplinary approach that ISIS referred to. When the first project of this type I was involved in was uh, a collaboration when I was part of the core group in Transition Durham, my permaculture teacher Wilf Richards and I who ended up collaborating on a project to um, working with a master's student to do work that would feed into the development of the Durham Local Food Network, and that's uh, well documented as a case study by the uh, Beacon North East project. Um, what was interesting about that research is we approached it from a point of view, well, how can we make this research of practical value to our transition group, to the local food network, while still allowing Amy, the master's student, to fulfil the academic aims. I was supervising the master's project, which allowed me to work as a, as a bridge. And when we reflected on the project in the course of the, the Beacon case study documentation and our own reflection, which is uh, as good permaculturists, good, uh, good transi transition as we uh, reflected on what had happened after the, after the event, we realised that the permaculture principles had sort of spontaneously emerged. We'd been approaching it as a permaculture project without really realising it or uh, making that explicit and that led us to start to draw out and look um, <coughs> look at how these principles have been manifest and with what, with what consequences and later in the collaboration with Michelle we, um, and with others we broadened that out and created a, a pattern language that identified drawing on our own findings and uh, uh, established findings in participatory action research and some of the original empirical findings of the research we collaborated on with uh, with Transition Network into a set of patterns for a a research research collaboration that's um, conducive to the practical aims of transition groups and their research needs as much as the academic needs. 
Um, that's you know, feeding into a broader project on pattern languages uh, um, that is looking at reconceptualising them, which I'll skip over as I'm going to speak. Part of the PLAS project I mentioned is about identifying systemic patterns, very general types of patterns that seem to be relevant to any field of endeavour where you're seeking to create this whole organic generative momentum that Chris Alexander talked about. Um, I came to use a forest garden as a, as a metaphor for, for this and I think everything gardens for me captures that notion of autopoiesis very well. It's about um, something cultivating the, the conditions for its own propagation and, the, and synergies with complementary systems. And I started to see the contrast between what we were trying to achieve through these couple of collaborations as um, quite like the contrast between a forest garden and a commercial monoculture, which in this pressure that academic researchers are under to focus on a very narrow range of yields, data collection, data in the service of academic publications, often all just as a service for research income. And we found that this work um, also started to pay attention to we needed to have those yields, we needed to collect data to make the research viable, but it was also attentive to the practical applications, to the the softer social yield, the quality of the relationships, what it was doing for the for the dynamics, the group dynamics within transition groups who were working in, what it was doing for the existence of a knowledge base and understanding that could support the further growth and development of transition as a movement, and the qualities of the personal experiences of, of the researchers and the uh, um, collaborators in research. How everybody having a good time, finding it a nurturing, life enhancing experience and feeding into the general motivation and energy of that work. Crucial, particularly to the Transition Research Network work, was this notion of beneficial relationships and we adopted that as a strap line that it was uh, some of, still on the front page I think of the Transition Research Network website about cultivating beneficial relationships between transition groups and academics and I always saw the, the notion of edge as crucial to that. How can this productive fertile edge between these two very different fields of endeavour really enhance both what can research academia learn from transition, what can transition and permaculture <coughs> learn from research. Yeah, the 12 home and principles we kept on mentioning those who don't have a background in permaculture uh, uh, might be less familiar with them there. A set of 12 general principles that David Holmgren described in his book um, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability and I think crucially it seems that Holmgren didn't intend these to be prescriptive, this isn't what you do this is the more descriptive of what happens when, when you get it right when your design has the uh, um, is appropriately well conceived to, um, uh, to allow all that's affected by it to flourish are we done for time? Yeah. Maybe a few more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> because you need, you cannot. Yeah. Does that include the question time? Uh, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, okay. you, uh, so I'll just go through the, the principles as <coughs> yeah as many as we end up having time for and give a few of my own observations and. At this point, I'd really like to invite any any comments on any of these, and your your feelings on uh, on on their relevance. And as I say, Isis and I came up with quite <laughs> different takes on uh, some sometimes some of the same uh, 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 similar observations. But in terms of observe and interact, there's it's a well known. 
principle in participatory research, but relationship building is key, and it's a bit like this idea of Bill Mollison that you spend the year just sitting and looking at your land before you do anything. The Certainly the quality of the research collaborations with Transition Durham were possible because I was already a member of the group, I had that hands-on experience, and when researchers aren't part of the group, successful collaborations that I see depend on long-term processes of, of relationship building. People have to be prepared to show up, just be there, get to understand what's going on in the community group before making a research intervention, and that not being directly productive of data, again, in terms of the, the range of yields, but vitally important in terms of the social relationships, the quality, the, um, the trust, the confidence, openness, the developing a common language. Um, I'd say at a, at, at a minimum, in terms of the, the aim here being to ensure that research isn't driven by academic fashions, by theories, by academic concepts, but is grounded in the practical needs, what really needs to happen and what's, uh, what's going on with this phenomenon. So I recommend a, some equivalent to the client interview as a, as a starting point in terms of, well, what do you really need from this research, from this project? In the anthropological tradition, we found uh, partisan observation really useful and in transition Durham, whenever we, a student got in touch with us and said that, for example, he said, I'd, you know, I'd like to do my dissertation on you, would say, well, we're not interested in that, but you're welcome to come along, become part of our group, even if it's temporary, join our meetings, find yourself a role, and do that in a way which supports and enables your data collection, your research needs, and when that often put them off, which we didn't mind. When they, when people responded to that, we found that it was always a really positive experience and they always had really, really high quality experiences and it seemed to improve the quality of their research. They got very good uh, high quality data and analyses, consistently high marks. Okay. So we heard from you about this earlier, Isis. Did you have anything further to add? No, just that the time, the dimension of that is really important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Actually spending the time with the phenomenon that you are interested in, the question, the question that you have, so if it's on a particular place, mm -hmm. it takes a long time to do those observations, to, to, to actually kind of meet the place. <coughs> so, does anybody yeah. else want to, want to speak to this principle? I don't know, yeah. Michelle will have very different perspectives from me on a lot of this, so we're well to contradict Well, I mean, I just find that useful for working with students for how to read, because I um, come from a philosophy background too, for how to read really difficult texts. <coughs> you know, there can be this idea that you can just know something instantly, but, um, and you should know something instantly, but using a permaculture approach to reading Der Derrida, for example, actually you need to spend a lot of time uh, you know, getting to understand the context and time with the actual text. Um, so, you know, like I find it can be helpful in ways you don't really expect, mm -hmm. even reading somebody that seems to be completely, you know, uh, you know uh, separated out from the agricultural work. Any, any I have one? a practical question. How is this approach accepted in universities today? Because uh, you said you had a PhD. Were you doing this when you did your PhD? It's from Kent. Yeah. Um, well, it was an anthropological PhD, so the, that's the method, in, the yeah. core method in anthropology is participant so observation. The even when you train in anthropological methods, they say you don't, don't well collect data in your first three months, but it's all going to be useless because you you don't understand the phenomenon <laughs> at all. So it sort of builds that in. And, uh, uh, in other disciplines, it's less recognised and harder to do and it, in my experience it's just as academics who are so committed to these values and these approaches but they're prepared to challenge the institutional pressures to... Uh, to, to I mean if you went to a university today and said I want to do a PhD and I want to apply anthropological style of research to I mean, my discipline is architecture for instance, mm -hmm. would it be considered or not? I mean how open are universities now, or is this just the beginning of uh, proposing this type of approach to a research system in the academic world? 
mm -hmm. there's not, I mean, I'm in an architecture school, so um, I mean, there's lots of participatory action research, there's, there's a lot of participatory research you could do within architectural mm -hmm. research, you could do, you know, for informatical methods in architecture. Um, I was using permaculture methods in a grant that I applied, I sort of mentioned um, permaculture and grant application. I mean, you know, they're only like single examples, I guess, but they're, mm -hmm. you know, it's about finding the right um, and that's the same thing I would say. You know, it is individual persons where you have, if you, that's your interest, you have to find it. But that's the first part of the research in a way. Find the right person at universities which have the interest. And I, I do think they exist, but they may be far and few. Um, <laughs> yeah. And maybe in some places they don't at, at all. I mean, I think we have to be realistic at the moment. We have to go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. We have to go for them somewhere else, but you can find them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's not generally institutionally supported. Mm. So it is very much going against the grain. Did you have a comment, Jay? I thought you had your hand up. Are they going to be made available? Yeah, I'll make, yeah, I'll make them available. Yes, sir. Um, in a way, we have five more minutes, so you know, yeah. kind of, if we are principle two, so we won't make them all, but yeah. maybe we should just also have some more general questions. We have an example here of Hel Master in Brazil. Yeah. Uh, she used it to a picture as a method of uh, research and to interact with the community. So the, the fisherman community. So she used the, the picture to allow the, the community interactive for her and to explain what is what's going on in the research and to create the research together to find some some kind of uh, problems, local problems to solve after that. This is an example of the yeah. observing interaction. Yeah. And it's yeah, it's a great example because um, Often talking or written communication is not the most effective way, especially yeah. if, uh, if there are literary, issue, literary issues or so. There's a, um, uh, a perhaps even deeper approach in things like participatory video, which again uses audio visual, but it invites people to use yeah. the tools themselves to, to communicate. There are a lot of useful elements in different research traditions. Offer any offer any general questions, and then we're going to move on to the next speaker soon. Okay. Well, I'll just uh, briefly talk about this one. Is um, uh, ISIS referred to earlier? Information is uh, is a form of energy, and research is, uh, as Rob Hopkins said this morning, collect data, transition black iron couldn't demonstrate what they'd achieved <coughs> if they didn't have data on the mileage, the carbon saving. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so on, and this uh, uh, systematically collecting information and, and making use of it is part of incremental building of capacity. Um, uh, but it's very important the forms this information takes from being accessible and legible to all people. Again, the you know, data and obscure arcane forms that's locked in academic repositories isn't necessarily as widely useful as it could be. Here I also really like the concept of energy, which isn't a typo there, and energy is the structures that come from prior organised accumulation of energy and allow us to use energy more effectively. Rainfall, rainwater harvesting was a uh, um, uh, an example we like when we talk about this in Durham, that you, know, you have water falling over all over the site. If you harvest that in one place and have the right distribution mechanisms, you can target exactly when and where it's needed. And also, information in the same way you, um, uh, uh, allows you not to have to revisit the same, the same ideas, not to have to have the same conversations again to make them incremental, allow knowledge and understanding to deepen. Um, again, patterns and pattern languages I find a really useful tool to summarise the standard of knowledge and the standard of information there, the energy at any particular point, and then by building on, unpacking, discussing, changing the patterns, you can 
allow the conversation to uh, to be incremental and uh, and build on that, so you captured and stored energy in some way. Mm. Yeah. Any quick comments on that principle? So, uh, sure, I'll pass you on. Brings to mind to me the concept of succession. Your last comment there, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you've spoken to that in your understanding of the other principles, but. Also, a way we can understand of capturing and storing energy is, uh, say, the analogy of building soil, right? So as pioneers, what are we doing? Uh, we're both shading and cooling the soil and allowing the microbial uh, environment to, to increase and increase organic matter. So, uh, yeah, I just see this as a way of what we're, we're, we're doing here. And I'm wondering, I don't really know what's happened with the development. I don't, with Thomas is here <coughs> at the British Research, uh, British Permaculture Association and Research Group. And I'd really like to have contact with that to know. And I feel like this would be, have been a wonderful workshop today to really workshop these principles together and mm -hmm. other aspects. Yeah. And I'm wondering what's yeah. available yeah. to us, and not just in the future, but while a lot of us are still and here over these next days. Tomorrow, meeting, here, 10 o'clock. Yeah. It's allowed to come. Uh, it's, it's, yes. yeah. Yeah. it's restricted. Well, it's, it's, al it's already full. Yeah, it's just a big lot. There's a lot of space. Yeah, restricted. Yeah, this space is restricted. It's. Um, I mean, that's a that's a that's a really uh, a, a good new insight, and I certainly haven't thought of it in quite that way about about succession. Okay. Um, I, know how to use this um, thing. I think there are examples of ways these have developed. The um, uh, one case would be the permaculture associations where they created the research handbook, which is a way of capturing and storing the energy, the capacity to put that information together. And now that's a tool for on-site research by permaculture practitioners. So it's a way of it's a renewable resource. Now it's not time limited like by, by research funding. There are always people out doing permaculture who can benefit from more rigorous documentation and that. Um, allows us to go from a succession of people thinking about well, how can we support on-site research to having a tool where there can be a wide movement of permaculture researchers using the handbook and potential to integrate that self-direct with on-site research. There's been a big shift as well in a lot of the conversation around transition research network is how can we manage these relationships better so they're um, enhancing and, mm. and productive rather than draining for transition groups. In Epilisa, that's conversations about how can we be proactive, how can transition permaculture eco villages be set in research agendas which wouldn't really be questions we could answer easily without having gone through those prior processes of understanding this edge. Mm. So it's a useful point, maybe it's worth uh, a first space in the convergence to uh, to to workshop that then I'd be happy to host that so I'll, I'll check yeah, with the organisers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay, so okay, yeah, we go over to our next thank you. <laughs> because we have both our we have two more speakers so and um, we don't want to be too late for lunch. So next one is Kerry and she is a cultural anthropologist and working for the University of South Australia. That's oh, um, actually, that right? that's changed. That's okay, changed good. Story, but that's okay, right. I can, I can um, introduce myself. So, so. Okay. Um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, this research project is kind of an example of a lot of the things that we were talking about, I'll, I'll be a running example that um, I've sort of been developing on the spot in my own time, um, completely unfunded and out of my own passion, really. Um, but it's an example of how um, research in this field can be transformative um, because if it wasn't for my engagement in this field and in this project, the whole job that I have now working at CQ University launching what is hopefully going to be one of the world's first nested tertiary level permaculture programs would never have happened. So I owe a lot to um, my participants and informants in the field um, and uh, also <coughs> I think that hope, I hope that this initiative is going to offer them quite a lot in terms of um, their development as permaculture practitioners and offer them a platform <coughs> to, to teach and spread, um, spread their message further. So, um, yeah, so for those who don't know, I will, I'm shamelessly promoting this because I think it's really important. <coughs> it is the first of its kind and um, 
uh, yeah, it needs to demonstrate viability for it to spread to other universities. Um, so I am now working at Central Queensland University. Um, I'm actually based in Adelaide in South Australia at the Adelaide branch of Seeker University, which is called Appleton Institute. Um, but we're launching this program from 2016, um, uh, available globally online with residential schools, uh, with the food forest in South Australia, um, Green School in Indonesia, and EcoCentro in Brazil. We're negotiating now, so it's pretty exciting. I don't know if you've probably already seen them, but pass it around. Um, <coughs> So if you, if you want to hear more about that, we've um, Graham Brookman's <coughs> organised a session where we're going to be speaking and running a workshop to hear from all of you guys as well about what you'd um, like to see coming out of this and, and, and as students what you'd like to see, as practitioners how you'd like to be involved, so um, please come along. Um, so I'm just going to run you through, I guess, talking um, firstly a bit about what Earthships are to provide you some background, then talk a bit about Earthship Iron Bank, the actual site, and then comment a bit about anthropology and how that relates and permaculture and how that relates. Um, so <laughs> normally, um, whenever I give a lecture associated with this, I start this with a formidable vegetable sound system yes. song, there's no such thing as waste. So if you can you know, imagine Charlie playing his ukulele right now and <laughs> singing that well-worn um, song, uh, you know, that phrase um, is an example again of the importance of anthropology and anthropological contributions to this. Um, that lyric itself reminds me of Mary Douglas's work on waste. There's no such thing as waste, only stuff in the wrong place. Um, but this slide demonstrates um, one of the core issues that Earthships are trying to address. Um, so I don't know how many people have seen that image of the tyre dumps. Um, but dumps like that are accumulating all over the world, countries all over the world, at massive rates. Um, and you can only imagine the issues with off-gassing and leaching that go on in these kinds of places. Um, does anyone want to have a guess as to how many millions of tyres per year in Australia alone are thrown away from passenger utility vehicles? No one? A guess. Any other? How many? I just said many. Lots and lots. Many. Millions, yeah. yeah. 50,000? Uh, a thousand? Yeah. I mean, if, um, uh, 52.5 million tyres in Australia alone wow. per year. Well, that's according to CETA resources. Sorry? How many cars are in Australia? Uh, I don't know how many cars there are, but yeah. Um, I mean, there's, you know, four tyres per car, so, four and you go through them. Yeah. Um, of this, only 13% are currently recycled. Um, I need to do some more research to find out what actually happens to the rest of these tyres because in South Australia there's actually a ban on landfill, landfilling tyres. Um, a lot of them are shipped in container deposit, uh, containers, uh, sorry, shipping containers over to um, uh, other countries who we expect to deal with, deal with our waste. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, also you can see over here, I don't know if you can see what that actually is. But it's that is a river in Indonesia, and so that's all, um, that's bottles and cans and plastics. Um, so really, waste globally is an absolutely massive issue, and it's something that often remains hidden. People think it just goes away. We all know now there is no such thing as a way, and we need to think of innovative ways to deal with this. And um, how many people here have heard of earthships or know what they are? Quite a few of you. So... In typical permacultural style, uh, the problem is the solution, um, and Earthships try and build with some of this waste and, and redirect it. How many people have seen this film, Garbage Warrior? A few, right? <coughs> so, uh, Mike Reynolds pioneered um, the building of Earthships in the, in the 1970s in South New Mexico. Uh, he was an architect who just thought that, you know, the way that architecture was practiced was absolutely appalling, and... Um, started experimenting with more radically sustainable ways of building um, in Taos, New Mexico. This <coughs> eventually led to him having his architecture licence revoked and this film documents his story of sort of fighting City Hall to get permits to, to build. And he talks about how a lot of the zones that he was working in in Taos were weapons testing zones and people could explode bombs but you couldn't build a house <laughs> to try and create a better future. It's all a bit crazy. But um, 
Uh, yeah, Earthships have now just um, spread all around the world. He's established a new film, which he calls um, bi uh, field, which he calls biotecture, rather than architecture. Now he's like, oh well, you take my architecture license away. I'll just create a whole new title for myself and my field and what I'm doing. So um, yeah, Earthships are being built all over the place now. Um, but interesting film, worth checking out if you're interested in it. Um, and uh, yeah, he he talks about the importance of building with waste um, in relation to the idea of building with indigenous materials, uh, that is building what's locally available. Um, and in a lot of places around the world, indigenous materials are waste products. They are what's around you to build with. And uh, Mike Reynolds often says, if I was given a million dollars to design the perfect building material, I'd create a tire. Um, because they create, create great um, structural stability and when you ram them with earth, they, they provide fantastic thermal mass um, as well. Um, and uh, they have a place out in Taos, New Mexico now where there's the greater earth community, um, a community full of people who are building these <coughs> earthships and they run the um, Earthship Academy there where people go and learn how to build earthships. Uh, one of the participants in the Earthship Iron Bank project that I'll talk about shortly just went and did the academy and um, had a bit of a discussion about Mike Reynolds who um, is quoted now in the Permaculture Association of South Australia magazine as saying, I think that Earthships and permaculture should have sex. <laughs> so there's a strong relationship between the two fields um, that's growing. Um, so to people who are familiar with Earthships, sorry to go through some of this stuff, but um, uh, these are the main Earthship design principles. So, um, although Earthships are often associated with building with waste and this whole idea of you know rammed earth tires and bottle walls and can walls, um, they don't have to have these features. Uh, any building that adheres to these principles can be called an Earthship according to Earthship Biotecture. So, uh, the first principle is obviously passive design or thermal solar he solar heating and cooling, um, which can maintain comfortable temperatures in any climate. Um, some of the studies on this really are fascinating, talking about research in the permaculture field. Um, the, oh, I'm saying I'm skipping ahead here, but um, the man who hosts the site I'm going to talk about shortly is actually a researcher at UniSA, and his PhD was on thermal modelling of Earthships. So he went across to Taos, New Mexico, and he did thermal modelling. And um, one of the fascinating things about Taos is the variation in temperature because it's a desert climate. They deal with temperatures um, ranging from sort of plus... 40, above plus 40 degrees Celsius to minus 40, and they can have snow on the ground. Uh, and in, even in these extreme climates, the Earthships maintain constant comfort temperatures of between 16 and um, 24 degrees Celsius. That's even with snow out on the ground, so it's pretty good stuff. Um, renewable energy through photo photovoltaic uh, wind power systems, on-site sewage treatment, um, uh, which uses grey water to flush toilets, uh, it actually recycles, Earthships recycle water four times um, through their system that I'll talk about a bit more in a sec. Uh, also, building with natural and recycled materials, um, including materials often considered waste. Um, it's important to note here, though, that one of the um, more controversial elements of Earthships is that they, they do still use a lot of concrete. So while, it, <laughs> while they claim to be building with natural materials and, and waste materials, um, they use a lot of conventional materials as well. Um, you definitely can't get away from that. Um, so yeah, water harvesting, as I mentioned, and then the, the food production system in the greenhouse, um, which uses wastewater for irrigation and a planter system that grows food on site year round with zero food miles. Um, so in some of these earth ships in the climates I was talking about before, you can have snow on the ground outside and bananas growing inside the greenhouse. So um, aquaponic systems as well. So this is just a cross section of an earth ship um, that demonstrates some of the principles that we just talked about. I won't labour on it too much because it's not really my field, but <laughs> also I've just sort of gone through it, but they're backed into an earth berm to provide thermal mass. And there's usually a, a rammed um, tire walls system going on, um, some kind of uh, harvesting of energy, um, usually through both wind and solar. Um, and then you have these water systems uh, that do the water recycling through from grey water through to black water, which then goes outside um, and runs through the... There's a greenhouse here um, to create natural convection. Um, you have cool tubes. Where's the cool tube on this one? 
Our Earth Turbine Bank it runs all the way along here and comes out the side to create that convection flow. Um, yeah, if there's more questions about that, we can come back to that later, I guess. Um, but this is our own garbage warrior <laughs> in the Adelaide Hills in South Australia. Um, this is Earthship Iron Bank, uh, Martin Frenny um, that I was talking about before, um, who fought to get this approved. It was the first um, council approved Earthship in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, it's still not quite complete, but it's certainly getting there. Um, we've done all the workshops. <laughs> Um, all the finishes are done now, so um, yeah, it's just getting it finalised and it's going to, he plans to have it operating uh, as a bed and breakfast in the Adelaide Hills to teach a lot of people about earthship design principles um, and also about permaculture. He's got quite an impressive permaculture property himself, um, reed beds, treating his water, composting toilets, orchards um, and a straw bale house that he lived in, he lives in now that he built himself before he started this project. So, um, yeah, that's Marty and the Earthship. <laughs> um, this is the project getting, getting started. Um, apparently, it all started in 2009. That's Mike Reynolds there, the original garbage warrior. <coughs> uh, came out to meet Marty and meet some of his industrial design students at UniSA and just said, why don't we just uh, go, go out to your property, Marty, and uh, pound some tyres, <laughs> and they got started. Um, of course, but Marty really wanted to do things properly and had this idea that you can't just create change outside the system, you've got to try and change the system as well. Um, so he really did take this on as a battle to try and get it through um, conventional systems. He open sources all these designs and gives them away for free, so once they're approved, hopefully this system can spread. But um, until that process of approval happened. He ceased building and uh, during that time ran this first workshop that I attended which, which was a chook ship workshop so we couldn't build structures for people to live in but so we built one for his chooks to live in in the meantime. So that's us pounding tyres there. Um, and then you can see here this was the um, actual approval, official approval um, that Marty received uh, in 2013 is it stamped I think or 2012 no 2013 in June um, so that was a huge milestone and um, <coughs> then Marty really went full bore with the Earthship the uh, workshops for the Earthship I keep complaining <coughs> um, and that's where during this time I thought it would be a fantastic site to conduct proper anthropological field work um, so in the meantime I got ethics approval through the University of South Australia um, and we got started on it um, so the workshops at, um, at Iron Bank uh, taught Earthship design principles and systems including energy, water, wastewater and food production, Earthship construction methods such as bottle brick making, bottle wall construction, tyre pounding and tyre walls, natural building techniques including cob stomping, that is so much fun, especially in the hot sun uh, in the summers in Australia that you get, uh, mud and lime rendering, flagstone floors, mud floors. Um, and the afternoons and evenings um, of these workshops were punctuated with a lot of really important discussion of music and festivities that were a really, really important part of this process. And during these workshops, uh, we had uh, at some point 60 people who travelled from all over the world to come and camp on site and participate in the workshops um, from anywhere from one to five weeks at a time, um, sharing their stories and their passions and their ideas. Um, and so the emotional, social and cultural aspects of these workshops are extremely significant and it's definitely something that really interested me. Um, <laughs> uh, some of the things that took place there were just, um, I mean, yeah, you, have to, you had to experience I don't know if you can see this picture very clearly, you probably can't, but that <laughs> was an example of Frock Up Friday. Um, because uh, one of the weeks where we did the work um, at Iron Bank, it, Adelaide was... Um, the hottest city in the entire world at that time. We had this massive heat wave and we were working really hard. I don't know if anyone's rammed earth into a tyre before, but it's <laughs> quite exhausting. Um, so we had to come up with ways to make it really entertaining and we had this Frock Up Friday thing and that was the cross-dressing Frock Up Friday. And Marty had just gotten his PhD, so he came out in a skirt, his doctoral cap and, <laughs> and his wife's bra. He'd be really thrilled, I'm telling you that story. Um, yeah. But 
it really was great fun and, and there's a, a sense of communitas that you get from everybody banding together to achieve these really difficult tasks and working together and sleeping together and sharing this experience. So, um, yeah, this is us installing um, the dome uh, roof. It's going to be a it became a ferro cement roof over the top of there. They're the earth dram tyres. Uh, this is what that structure then became. Um, so that's the main room. Uh, the greenhouse is a, was installed on top of that timber frame, as you can see. Um, that's what it ended up looking like. Um, yeah. So, um, let me just skip through. Yeah, so in terms of um, the actual research approach, um, it was obviously participant, the main approach was participant observation. Um, but also I conducted a lot of um, interviews with key informants and gathered a whole bunch of field work, field work and ethnographic data. Um, and did a lot of, <laughs> obviously, literature reviewing of other researchers who've done anthropological research in, in the permaculture movement. Um, and I was particularly interested in the work of Haluza Delay and Berezin, who found that um, the permaculture workshops that they studied in Edmonton created a community of interest or a learning community which created systems of information exchange and social networking, both physical and virtual, that fostered what they argued was the development of an ecological habitus. I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with this sociological term. Uh, it's a term from Pierre Bourdieu, um, basically referring to um, a practical reason that operates beyond the level of reflexive consciousness, a sort of feel for the game that we have. Um, and he argues that an ecological habitus enables people to live sustainably without trying. So that's without reflecting on it to make the most sustainable choice when presented with different situations. Um, so um, they argue that there's a misfit between the ecological habitus that develops within permaculture communities um, and the general habitus of consumer society. So when people return back into society following permaculture workshops, there's often this sort of, um, they're confronted by this misfit um, and tend to revert <coughs> um, towards a different kind of habitus. However, they argue that the permaculture networks that are formed throughout these things provide social support for the ongoing development of the ecological habitus. Um, so these are the kind of processes that I'm really interested in following as a result of this experience. The main workshops are over now, um, but I'm still conducting field work um, tracking the development of the people who participated and the networks they've developed and the projects they're all working on now. So, um, so I was going to do the same thing here and go through all ten <laughs> principles and talk about how they relate to anthropology. Um, I'll just mention the most obvious ones because um, we've already done that over, haven't we? So um, the most obvious one is to observe and interact, which is a key component of participant observation, the main tool of um, anthropological research. Um, I think the other key things that relate to the permaculture movement, that relate anthropology to the permaculture movement, are these ideas of um, using the edges and valuing the marginal. So just to point out that anthropology has a history um, of conducting research at the margins of society. Um, and of engaging in a sort of activist anthropology with social movements. Um, you think, most obviously, you think of David Graeber and his work with the Occupy movement. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, it really is well suited to this kind of research, I think. And, and this dynamic tension uh, that you mentioned, um, Isis, between um, positivity and critical criticality as sort of fundamental components of the anthropological approach to... Um, to uh, participant observation, um, that sense of critical reflexivity, but also the focus on understanding the meaning of events for participants and not judging that or assessing its value or effectiveness, but seeking to really understand it. Um, so I um, actually came into this not knowing much about permaculture at all and not thinking I was researching permaculture. But that's definitely something that very clearly came out of, came out of the research itself um, and out of the workshops. So um, you'll see in this top corner here, I don't know if you can, can you read the, these bits? Are they two? Yes. Okay, <laughs> well, this is um, <laughs> Holmgren's Permaculture Flower from the Essence of Permaculture. 
where it talks about the different domains of permaculture, and up the top these are different aspects of those domains. Um, obviously the Earthship, uh, Earthship workshops, um, they're biotexture, so that's explicitly listed as an element of permaculture. Um, and they also explicitly covered natural building, owner building, passive solar, water harvesting and reuse. So like this whole quadrant was really a main focus and an obvious focus. Um, but throughout the time spent camping and being on site and participating in the workshops, every single one of these was covered in discussions, in informal discussions, in interactions, uh, in the activities of the participants. Um, so, yeah, it seemed pretty clear the connection between earthships and permaculture and what was going on there in this broader social movement. Um, so the other thing to think about is that we start, I started this talk um, by talking about um, the role of waste in earthships and the issue of building with waste. Um, and earthships are um, quite a controversial approach to building. Um, uh, some claim they're you know, radically sustainable solutions that provide integrated systems of living that challenge our you know, current um, consumptive approach, hyper-consumptive approach to living. Um, but others um, really point out some of the life cycle issues with things like building with waste. Um, particularly, for example, if you think about can, um, the can and bottle walls in a state like South Australia that has been pioneering with container deposit legislation. <laughs> and, you know, we, we do have ways of, um, of dealing with that waste in a really productive way. Um, so this may not, you know, sticking them in a cement wall <laughs> for all of eternity may not be the best way of, of dealing with that resource, particularly aluminium, which is, you know, going to have to be mined again if it's not returned to the stream. So there, there are life cycle issues with this approach to building with waste. Um, however, I argue that building with waste actually functions as a metaphor for participants uh, for the construction of new cultural and social systems from the ruins of a decaying industrial society. Um, and it also serves a second function of enabling the social structures and relationships formed throughout this building process to become literally embedded in the building. And this provides a sense of permanence from impermanence. A lot of these interactions with the buildings themselves, with each other, were quite temporary and everyone was aware of the temporary nature of the interaction because people had travelled from everywhere and you had this, conf this magical constellation <laughs> of like-minded individuals located on a site for a really limited period of time. Um, so, yeah, but um, also uh, this waste metaphor is emblematic of a shift from consumption to production, which I think is really important in permaculture, um, as epitomised by this quote from Bill Mollison. The greatest change we need to make is from consumption to production, even if on a small scale. Um, so yeah, preliminary results of the fieldwork suggested that most participants were already interested and involved with permaculture or related interests um, prior to coming to the workshops, even if they hadn't heard the word permaculture and didn't use it themselves. Um, but I argue that involvement in the workshops led to a speeding up and deepening of engagement across the permaculture domains. Um, and so that the workshops functioned as a kind of cultural catalyst, um, leading to transformations in the everyday practices of participants beyond the workshops. And um, I'm currently working with Marty, who hosted me at the site, to try and develop a survey um, to capture the spillover effects associated with the workshops. And um, obviously I'm aware of the issues with you know, self-reporting and, and that kind of thing, so um, we're hoping to compare and contrast these results with the data from ethnographic observation. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is sort of a mock-up of the survey that we're trying to look at, um, which will involve triangulation of data to help overcome self-reporting issues uh, through the field notes and interviews obtained through the workshops and ongoing social network analysis through social media, as well as this survey where we're going to be looking at issues of um, knowledge and engagement before and after the workshops, but also looking at people's behaviours. Um, yeah. Um, Can I just ask, are you using mm -hmm. that kind of survey post their attendance? You were yes. to get pre and post surveys? No, we didn't get anything pre, so it's just post survey. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they're going to have to. So I can see your question is yeah, what did you feel like before? What do you before and after, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, we don't have a baseline to compare it to. We're just going to have to rely on self reporting sure. um, for that, but also tracking changes. Um, that have been obvious to me um, 
through my networks and associations with these people over the, over that time period. So you're doing comparison. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so if you're interested to hear more about this, um, Marty and I have actually published the first paper that's actually available, should be available online, uh, which talks about all of this in a bit more detail. Um, and I've got another paper talking about this whole waste as metaphor issue that's coming out in a publication um, that we'll come publishing with Routledge next year called Subverting Consumerism and Reuse in an Accelerated World. Um, yeah, so <laughs> Great, that's me. You want uh, one or two questions while you put up your little thing? Any questions, please? I don't know questions, but uh, since you put us a sustainable housing alternative, but we don't have land in the planet to use it as a, on a wide scale, on a large scale. Yeah. Sorry, earth ships, you mean? Yes, you, you can't, you can't do bring them on a larger scale because there's no land. Um, yeah, although Reynolds has done um, different types of prototypes um, for urban um, earthship communities where they are next to each other stacked and layered and he's also um, been commissioned to build an earthship apartment in New York between two skyscrapers where he puts the mirrors up. Um, but yeah, it, it's not a solution. Okay, so then if I could do it on PDF, I'll do it that way. What do you mean the mirrors up? Oh, right, so you can imagine if you have an Earthship sort yeah. of at ground level in between two giant skyscrapers in the middle of New York, um, you're going to have some trouble getting um, the solar capture going on. Uh, okay. So he, he just, they used mirrors at the top of the skyscrapers to reflect solar down to the panels. Um, yeah, so, I'm, but I'm, you know, the purpose of this research, it's not to, um, so what was this discussion at the start? It's, it's um, more to examine the meaning rather than the function, like the effectiveness of the solution. Yeah. You mentioned as a, an alternative to sustainable housing, and I can see it in, in rural yeah. environments when you can have yeah. 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 It's promoted. Battery. It doesn't always mean that. Battery. Yeah. No, it, it, it's promoted it, it will be another presentation here. Housing. That doesn't necessarily yeah, another one. Function I'll take it. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm not hoping to evaluate that. Marty's research does go more into the evaluation, um, take more of an evaluative approach to sustainable building because he is an architect and that's more of his training. Um, but yeah, there's arguments for and, uh, and against in terms of effectiveness. No, my thing mm. is not effectiveness of the um, but the feasibility in terms of social mm. Yeah, yeah. No. In, in evaluating people and getting their stories back, what type of changes have they begun to implement after this? Um, the scale of changes is just unbelievable. It's just massive, the things that came out of this, and all in different areas, and it depended what people's skill sets were. Um, a lot of people uh, established uh, permaculture training sites and, and farms and businesses. Um, there's the Living Solutions Building Network in Canada that was established. Um, there are, I think there have been at least five off the top of my head people that set up their own natural building company. Um, and that's not just building earth chips, but all kinds of different approaches to natural and sustainable building. So, yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering, Yeah. And in some ways, it's, it's, it's even less about the scale of change, but the, 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 the way people are beginning to link the issues that, that are important to you. Yeah. Um, and then you can select the, the key domains that are important to your research, the key areas, maybe it's social, maybe it's, maybe it's about social engagement, maybe it's about the environment, maybe it's about economy, you know, mm. different, different elements. And, and I guess when you capture all of those stories, you can code them in a way which helps you to then also see how people are linking the changes. Yeah. I mean, it's a, as a tool, it's not without a problem, but yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's it's a very it's, it's very adaptable. Yeah. To, to how you might want to use it, and that, in some ways, allowing people to tell their stories is different from just surveying. Oh yeah, yeah. Give you a, a much kind of much more textual uh, 
Yes, that's very important. Yeah, and so we were, we were going to make sure that there there are there are there is a lot of room in that survey for people to tell their stories as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not the survey method was really cho chosen because there's no funding or time. Do you know what I mean? It's just expedient. <laughs> yeah. 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 <coughs> Sorry for taking more time, but so, so no. facilitated how are you suggesting? Because now so obviously everyone's scattered all over the world. Well, then you can bring groups of people together. I mean, if you if you do yeah. That. It depends where they are. Oh, they're all all, all over the world now. Yeah. But are there not groups around around the area where it was built? No, not no. really. Okay. Not really. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm, we, we can, can continue that yeah. after lunch. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to introduce our final speaker. I mean, I don't even say anything. So, so your name is already here. Yes. And the floor is yours. Great. Yeah. I'm Ted Bonner, and sorry for being late, just like an no, academic. <laughs> so, um, thank you. So, let me introduce you to my colleague, Marcia Amadon, yes. who's actually one of America's preeminent uh, children's authors. And so, we are trying to incorporate narrative into this work. And so, I think that uh, she's actually more interesting than I am, so you should probably want to talk to her. Um, this, this is the kind of, uh, this is my third IPC, and this is the kind of talks we should have been having at the first one, uh, because it's a very, very critical conversation. Um, Isis, your, your, your comments about how we develop a methodology to me are just absolutely vital. I mean, a absolutely vital, you know. Um, you know, and, and how do we think that through, right? Um, you know, and then we have to think through, you know, as Tom said, what is trans formative research mean, you know, especially when we as researchers are embedded in the object of research? Like th these are very, very big questions. Um, and Carrie, I mean, I, I just think setting Bordeaux is so hot, you know, <laughs> but the question becomes, you know, when we think about uh, cognitive dissonance, you know, permacultures were sort of a sort of a out there field, you know, we always have to remember that structures are always restructuring and are structured. Yeah. So really, as social scientists, how do we deal with the structural issues? Because often we think through systems, yeah. So I'm changing my talk because you all are much smarter than I anticipated, okay? And I guess a couple of things to notice in this talk is, is that number one, the language shift. So the language is actually my attempt to try to shift to your typical permaculture audience, okay? Which I'm trying, we're all trying. Um, and the second thing is, is citing sources which we've heard a lot of, because we went to a lot of these events, and no one is citing sources. And in my field, sociology, there is a very despairing message that's coming out of a lot of our work on globalization, which is that if we're looking at the end of modernity, what is happening to epistemology? I mean, you all teach undergraduate classes, and sometimes you walk your way like, well, who cares? Right? And I think a lot of what permaculture might have the chance to do is bring epistemology back in, as Carrie is trying to do, to, to embed our research fields in something that is dynamic and vibrant. Right, Because we all sort of have been in the glass towers of academia doing our research, and no one's actually listening. So for this crew, it's worthwhile just discussing a little bit about American sociology. Um, we were very strong empiricists and did our good quantitative analysis up through the 60s and 70s, really a lot of structural analysis. And then starting in the 80s, we went through a cultural turn. And we got very interested in the notion of meaning, right? So that's sort of the uh, work you would find in anthropology, for example, right? Um, because we found that our field was lacking a whole side of its discipline. Yes, we could understand patterns and structures, but we couldn't understand that embedded meaning. So it has, since the 80s, still continued into that. And then starting in the 90s, there was a discussion about how we make sociology relevant again. right? Because the thing is, is we got very good at being descriptive, but we were horrible at being prescriptive. We didn't know how to do anything. right? And that's kind of ironic for American sociology because that's how we started. It all started around trying to heal issues of race and class and gender. And we forgot how to do our own work. So really, permaculture for me is just even a further continuation of that cultural turn into what we call public sociology, okay? And permaculture seems like one great tool to get us there, right? Okay. 
So now I'll talk. And um, I guess we're done at one, um, which is important because lunch is lunch is important. Yeah, we started like ten minutes later. So okay. If, if you are, if you make it interesting, we can. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So we have a company. This is sort of the paradigm we work on. As we all know, technology, or at least the sociologists would define it, is epistemology. It's knowledge. Right. Okay. And we all are very concerned about this. And sociology, I'll trust you all know what I mean. Maybe not. We'll get into that a bit more. I'm not going to get through this talk today. I will not be able to talk about our project in Ukraine, which we're working on right on the border of Russia. Um, drink a lot of vodka there. Yeah, da, da. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe later another time. Okay. But really the core thing is, is that should permacultures be attempting to do social science? And I think what I've heard in this group is, well, maybe what we should get to is really something like this, okay? Which is work done by Bill Reed, and he was sort of the father of something that we call integrative design in America, and really it's about the collaborative effort of many disciplines in creating transformational projects, right? Okay, and so, so here we see permaculture, and it's always this loop back and forth, right? But the fact is, is that we can't expect permaculturists to ever be able to do the quality of work as someone as you all that have been doing research for God knows how long, right? It's very hard to do social science work embedded in these projects, I personally find. And frankly, it can be dangerous, you know? I mean, I guess in your field too, you go into somewhat compromised situations, right? And, you know, it's not always so fun, okay. Okay, uh, let's go on. Okay, let's get into sociology, right? I mean, this is sort of like the whole notion of what sociology is, right? I mean, we have on you know one end this whole notion that basically we're trapped in the iron cage, right, of rationality that we can't escape. Or if we want to put flowers on it, that basically we're trapped in a web of life, right? Okay, you know, whatever that means. And on the other hand, you know, we have good old Nietzsche here saying that we can transcend our existence. That tension always exists in soci sociology, it always does. And it always needs to be revisited. The core question for us folks is really how much can we actually change, right? I mean, that's always the big, big question that haunts us, okay? Um, and my colleagues, they found that for our projects, you need a minimum of two years, a minimum of two years to create any sort of real transformational change, in part because of habitus. We do not embody those practices until they are lived and relived and lived again. Right? It, take, it takes a while. So how do we do permaculture projects knowing it's going to be a minimum of a two-year project? Minimum, right? And if you're, if you're dealing with social conflict, it's going to be even longer, as in Ukraine. Okay. Okay, so, you know, here we are again. And, you know, we're looking at, again, other issues. How are we dealing with domination, right? Because that's a big topic in social science. And again, it's this whole notion, at least in American sociology, of embodied domination. You know, mm. these subtle practices of how our habitus is shaped by forces beyond us. No wonder permies, when they're out there, they come back and they feel like free-floating beings, not being grounded to anything, right? Because we'll get to later in the talk, you know, Foucault's work, very clearly demonstrated our domination is partially accepted, okay? And that is a problem, right? What I often try to get people to understand is, is, is that our work really is first about understanding ourselves. And this gets back to methodology. Because the problem is, as social scientists, we were not trained to be actually the same actors in our own play. At least I wasn't, you know, I was trained in the tra classical way where we study our objects, yeah. you know, and all of a sudden, what if you are the actual object, and what if you're actually the one trying to be the mechanism of that change while you're researching what you're doing? And there's, there's no good answers to these things. I, you know, we try, right, but, but I, just, I just don't think we, we have a good answer. We all know how to study things, you know, but the question is how do we study things and transform them at the same time. Because you, you know, obviously are tampering with the object of your research. Yeah? I mean, which is a big problem. Yeah, at least the way we sort of think about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So in sociology, this is our work, and frankly, any permaculturist that attempted to do sociology, uh, they would be kicked out of the field because they do not meet our code of ethics. Okay? So in American sociology, you have to be professionally competent, you know, it's integrity because we know this research could be very dangerous because you're playing with people's lives. We have to go through community advisory boards to do our research. All these things in America that you don't have to do in other parts of the world, right? But nevertheless, you know, we have to maintain that level of integrity. Um, professional and scientific responsibility, that's a huge topic, right? I mean, we all have seen social science projects go bad. I mean. In my department, we've had people arrested. You know, one guy was, uh, was researching the mob and refused to give over his data. You, we all know the term going native. It does happen, right? And so we're, should we really expect permaculturists to be doing this work? I, I say no. Yes, be part of the team. But I expect you folks to have a level of skill that we wouldn't expect from permaculturists. And of course, we all respect people's rights and dignities and diversity, but what does that mean? I mean, I, I mean, topics of diversity are a huge topic. So in America, <coughs> we're having a big debate where really the, it, it's the issues of race are mystifying the issues of class, right? So, you know, we have these great discussions about creating diversity and everything in America, but really is that mystifying the whole issues of class, which people are starting to say, yeah, that's probably what's going on. Okay. Permaculture principles. I guess we'll throw them up too, right? <laughs> um, but I will say what's interesting about these permaculture principles, and I'll slide this in now, is, is that this is part of the syncretic approach that we are starting to work on, Marsha and I with others. And these actually are slightly informed by fourth way thinking, Wuzpensky, Gurdjieff. And in fact, my mentor is in that lineage. Uh, John, John Bennett in the United States. These thinkers that all come out of fourth way thinking because for us, that seems to be a way to start to bridge permaculture and social science a little bit. And so my mentor who taught me permaculture many, many years ago, this is sort of through the lens of fourth way thinking a little bit. A little bit different, right, than what you might see in Australia. But part of fourth way thinking is always trying to bait the question versus giving the answer, right? So, okay. And for us, you know, we again sort of revisit what we mean by regenerative development, okay? And I think for social scientists in this room, I would argue a lot of us are stuck in tropes of Gemeinschaft. We all want to talk the quaint story. Well, what does that story really mean? I expect Carrie to be able to give us higher levels of meaning to what that story is. But we all want to talk about the ancient elders, or who the hell were they? And really, quite frankly, if we're talking about, if we're talking about history, we, we only have to go so far to realize history is the story of the present, right? I mean, there's enough philosophy of history written to suggest that when we start to introduce these symbols, these histories, so to speak, what we're really doing is making a narrative about our present. Okay, and that's, that's a big, big problem because this is really what people base their knowledge on, stories and beliefs. I don't find many people at these conferences citing papers. When I hear it, I, I quiver in happiness because someone's <laughs> citing research. Thank God, okay? All right, so, you know, from this way of thinking, and this is a work done by Bill Reed again, and Bill Reed is probably one of the leading people in sustainable development. The, the whole notion is, is that we're sort of stuck down in this materialism, consumption, big, 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 big problem. We know this, you know, we sort of move into efficiency, better light bulbs, right, better material things, really trying to buy our way, you know, out of a big global problem. But that's not going to work. We, we, we know that. Um, and probably the, the, the bigger problem here is, is, is that um, that consumption has a level of domination in and of itself, mm -hmm. okay? So we get to sustainability, maybe, whatever that is, okay? Um, and, you know, we see work in trying to restore the past, 
but really that's our present, right? And whose past is it? Where we try to get to, again, fourth way thinking is this notion of psyche, which for us is a Greek word that combines life and spirit, okay? It's, a, it's, a, it's a Greek, I love Greek. I love Russian, I can't speak it, I pretend. But the fact is, is that, you know, it's the Greeks always have these terms that sort of fuse levels of meaning to what we're trying to do, okay? And, you know, here we are, up in existential life. You know, very, very hard to get to. But really, if we want to save our planet, this is where we have to be. Well, we're not going to do it at sustainability. We're just, we're just not. So that's sort of like the lens through permaculture is. Okay. So here's the problem. Is, is that, yeah, sociologists, we study patterns. You know, we do our surveys. We do whatever data collection method we have, whatever tools we use, right? Um, ethnography, you know, I'm really mostly interested in ethnography right now. And so we create this linkage between meaning and patterns, right? Okay, <coughs> patterns is not the word we would use in sociology, but, you know, I'm trying to shift the language for us, okay? Um, permaculturists are over here, right? Okay, they're very interested in development, right? And of course they study mostly land patterns, but patterns of social science seem to be getting to be of more interest to people, okay? But there's no good link here. And to me, that, 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 is, that is why these fields are, are really, we see the potential, but they're also very divergent. And this, this is the hard piece, because it's here where people go crazy. Marsh and I are working on a project in America's wealthiest town, and it was a project, partially anthropological, okay, about taking one of their oldest buildings to create an art house to regenerate their art, okay? But the interesting thing is, is that when people saw that, that, this, that, 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 that we were actually changing the meaning, the symbols from the way they used space, two people tried to hit me with their cars. Yeah. Yeah, because the thing is, 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 that, is that, you know, it, it's very complicated, but people, you know, again, you know, we're we are social scientists. Here we are trying to create transformation, too, right? So we're, we're actually right in there and not distancing ourselves. So it isn't that we write about the situation and send it off to a journal and, you know, no one's ever going to see it. We're right, we're right down in the war zone. And so because we are the masters, I hate to use this phrase, of manipulation to some degree, okay, um, we open ourselves up to big problems when people tap into a meaning that is violent, using Bordeaux again, to their symbols and to their way of life, even if it's in their best self-interest. Mm -hmm. And how many times do we see people doing things against their own self-interest, right, okay? So this is, this is what I see as, as, as the big problem. Um, but to bring it back to a happier note, you know, this is where the two fields, in, in my sense, they're trying to meet, okay? It is the field, literally using Bordeaux again, right? It is the field of, 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 of contest, of collaboration, of land, of space, of power right? All these various things. And so, you know, that's why I'm very big on, on, on integrative design approaches, collaboration, you know, respecting what each field has to offer for their own, for their own uh, purpose. This to me, Tonkis, I love this quote, because, you know, the, spatials, the spaces of so social life are social products. It seems so obvious, but we don't realize what footprint we socially leave in our own manifestations, even as permaculturists, right? And so we all touch social space, you know? And so the point is, is, is that how can we sensitize this community to the effect we have? 
because I've seen time again where we've, Marsha and I were in Cuba, <coughs> and we go to this farm, and the farm manager is like, I am so excited, and everyone's expecting to hear about how he's doing something new around permaculture, and he's like, no, my son is leaving here and going to the city to be a doctor. And everyone's like, no, you know, and it actually created, it was insulting. You know, because we came in there, you know, with an ideology, and we're obviously manipulating ourselves as social space through our own interaction, but the fact is, he wanted a better life for his son. And we have to remember, you know, no one in our group, you know, me just a little bit, had ever studied Cuba and realized the levels of domination around agriculture, you know, and the Castro regime, to a degree. Okay. Uh, I won't go into this too much, but this is a little bit of what people are doing out there that I see in permaculture kind of settings. Um, we'll go on from there. I will say that Regenesis is in New Mexico. They, they do very interesting work that enters the anthropological realm. And, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I think we think as academics, the most interesting papers are the ones we want to criticize because there's something there. They're, they're getting into something. I personally, I'll get into this, but story of place for me is kind of a problem. Um, does anyone have charrettes in their countries? Yeah. Yeah? So, charrettes, the founders of it in America, uh, the National Charette Institute, one of them is a sociologist, and he constantly realized there was a problem with the very process they created. Because they create great will. Like people are like, yeah, let's change. And no one knows what they're changing to. Yeah. You know, and that's the problem with it. It doesn't have the initial anthropological work or sociological work or ecological work or anything behind it to frame coherence. So I love these people because they get <laughs> I love people. That you're yeah. No, well, you know what I mean. I mean, exactly they, I mean yeah, these people are great at creating energy. So you get poor people next to, like, you know, the, one, the very rich people that are ripping off the poor people, and they're all sitting at the same table singing Kumbaya. But the fact is, no one knows what they're getting. Okay? But it's a, it's a sociological process. I, I got to give them credit for that. And, you know, Robin's work, I don't know too well, but, you know, she's trying, right? Okay, I'm going to end this with this final slide because it's 10 after and lunch is so nice, okay? But this is just maybe for something to think about and we can continue this discussion. This is Africa. Um, I didn't do this project. I know about it. We were all in South Africa. And, you know, when I first saw it, I thought it was so freaking interesting because what they did is the village had no water and they basically didn't have really electricity either, enough for generating water. And so they created this miracle round device to pump water to the village. Smart enough. Smart enough, absolutely smart enough. But the thing they did not expect, because they're not social scientists, is that it actually created relationships between warring tribes. So the children were playing, because they, they're, they're not embedded in the social conflict. So they're all getting along. And the adults are like, oh, wait a minute, if they can get along, why can't we, right? And all of a sudden, they made them the kings and queens of the villages. Okay, so this is by accident this happened, all right? And that's fine, okay? But it still leaves me these questions. You know, why didn't it take Western experts to get involved with this? Right? I mean, because really, shouldn't the work be to get people to find their own way? And sociologists would always ask, well, in that very process of Westerners coming in, the Western experts being paid good, good contracts and everything, what form of domination are implicitly or explicitly embedded in that process? Um, are we generating health if we're reproducing structures, systems, and regimes of power and possibly domination? And what fields are best handled to answer such questions? These are questions. 
I'm not going to answer them today. That's, that's not the role. But I think we have to think about this when we're doing our work, OK? And I mean, I'm always haunted by what Foucault picked up on, which I actually agree with, is that in its function, the power to punish is not essentially different from that of curing or educating. Yeah. You know, I mean, because, you know, maybe our Western technology is not always such a bad thing, but there is always some cost that comes with it. And that, that's the piece that haunts me, because I am way too humbled in my field to want to assume I have the answer to anything. Just, I just don't even want to do that. I really want to understand what's going on. And we can't forget the great African scholars who wrote enough about colonialism, the Marxist scholars, you know, me, and the Kumba, all these scholars who picked up so clearly on this psychological problem of colonization is, is that it isn't just that you're taking the material resources, you also <coughs> are basically weakening people internally within their own psychology. Mm -hmm. And that's the piece that I just, it just, it just haunts me. Because I don't think we have the regenerative, visionary answer yet on how to deal with this. And of course, it's going to shift from project to project.